Hi, everyone. This is Taylor Broquet. Uh, I'm a 3L here at Iowa Law, and today we're going to discuss creating effective rule statements. Now, this is an important topic because rule statements really are, um, they're critical to any piece of legal writing. To give you an overview of um, what we'll be discussing for our presentation today, we're going to first talk about the purpose of rules. Um, what they are, why they are important, and then also two important aspects of creating effective rule statements. And that means we're gonna look at predictive rules as well as rule synthesis. But before we uh, dive into these, I wanted to mention that many of you have been taught um, you know, there are different formulas for legal writing. So some of you have uh, been taught CREAC, others IRAC, CRAC, perhaps. But at the end of the day, these all share the same elements and uh, they all share rule statements. So it truly is um, critical that you master creating effective rule statements. So what are rule statements? Why are they important? Well, Rule statements are used to establish the governing legal rule that the court will then use to resolve the issue at hand. And what's the legal rule? Well, this really is a formula for making a decision. So rule statements are important then because they set up your analysis section. Remember, you shouldn't have any rules in your analysis section that you don't outline first in your rule section. So. Rule statements both set up your analysis or establish the governing legal rule, set up your analysis, and then they give the reader the lay of the land, uh, which gives your paper structure um, because it signals to your reader what you're going to be discussing in your paper. So at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that we'd focus on the two important aspects of creating effective rule statements. The first category we'll discuss uh, is predictive rule statements. Now, the good news is that by now, you all have had some experience with predictive rule statements. Think of the memos that you wrote or are currently writing. These rules are all about predicting a specific answer or a likely outcome to a legal issue. So as we go through, I'll touch upon how to identify rules how to write rules, and then how to organize your rules as well. So when thinking about your rule statements, you'll want to uh, remember that the rule statement should look like a funnel. What this means is that you'll want to begin with a macro rule, which is the core substantive rule. Um, these are the ones that you'll most likely organize in your roadmap. Then you'll want to address any supporting rules or sub rules um, that discuss how a rule should be applied or what the timing is for when a particular rule uh, should be applied. You'll wanna discuss each subsection in your discussion um, portion of your paper, analyzing one element at a time. So I like the funnel because it really shows that you wanna go from the broadest rule to most narrow. All right, so how do we identify these macro rules then? Thankfully, we have some magic words that can help us out. So when trying to identify uh, the rule, look for words or phrases such as, we hold that, the present case is controlled by, in this jurisdiction, or as a matter of common law. These are some, some nice magic words to help identify those macro rules. Next, let's talk about how to write macro rules. Now, there are three criteria to keep in mind um, that will be helpful. So you want your rule to be simply stated. Uh, you want it to be readily applied, as well as consistent with the jurisdiction's cases and laws. So simply stated, that just means avoid any legalese, right? You want to keep, um, you want to stick with plain English. Also paraphrasing when you can. This helps uh, build your credibility with your reader as well. If you're quoting all the time, it actually detracts rather than adds to your credibility. Readily applied, this means that you want to avoid vague rules with terms not easily defined, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. And then 
consistent with the jurisdiction's cases and laws. This means using proper words of authority and distinguishing between factors and elements. And again, um, we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But with respect to making sure it's uh, a rule is readily applied, we're gonna turn to an example here. So let's test out what we know so far. Here we have Jennifer Walters and Jennifer Walters is an attorney. She's trying to create a rule statement about eyewitness accuracy in a criminal case. So at first, this is what Ms. Walters comes up with for her rule statement. When a witness can get a good look at the accused, then the court is likely to rule that the witness's testimony about the accused's appearance is accurate. Now, can you spot which term is at issue here? I'll give me a moment to think about it. All right, for those of you who said good look, that's exactly correct. Um, so how could the writer improve this rule? Well, we need to define what a good look means. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you went up to random people in the street and you asked each one of them, what does a good look mean? They'd probably all have different answers for you, which is a problem in legal writing when you're trying to predict an outcome. Um, so you really want to drill down and define um, vague terms like that. So by defining a good look um, even more, we get if a witness is able to see the accused's facial features clearly, then the witness's testimony is likely accurate. See how this is way more helpful for the reader to understand what the rule and therefore what the law actually is. All right, so let's talk about using proper words of authority then. Again, this helps us extract accurate rules. So there are different are different rules set forth different duties, rights, prohibitions, and entitlements. So the accuracy of your rule statements truly depends on you using the proper words of authority. You'll want to then match the level of authority that you write in your memo uh, or brief or other legal writing with that used in your cases to ensure an accurate rule. So for example, we have mandatory rules and the words that you might see or word you might see with mandatory rules um, is must, okay? Other types of rules we have are discretionary rules. So here you'll likely see the word may, and we also have prohibitory rules, may not. Again, you wanna be sure to distinguish rules correctly because if a rule mandates certain action, uh, you wanna make sure you're using must rather than may. Now, let's turn to the two types of rules that can cause some confusion. My hope is that after this presentation, you'll feel more confident to take these rules head on. Um, so first, uh, we have rules with elements and we have rules with factors. Rules with elements means all components in the rule must be met for the outcome to occur. Whereas rules with factors these are areas of inquiry for the court to consider, but not all factors need to be present for the outcome to occur. So let's go through some examples. For rules with elements, again, all components in the rule must be met for the outcome to occur. The important thing to note is that rules with elements can include only one element or possibly multiple elements. But if there are multiple, then every single element must be present for the outcome to occur. So here, um, an example, we have an outcome is X if A or an outcome is X if A, B, and C are present. Um, let's look at another one. To establish negligence, the plaintiff must show we have that mandatory rule there, must show all of the following. Notice because it says all, again, this, uh, this lets us know that we're dealing with an elements test or an elements rule rather than factor. So um, 
The plaintiff must show that the defendant owed plaintiff a duty, that the defendant breached that duty, the plaintiff was harmed, and the defendant's breach of duty caused plaintiff's injury. All right, so if we take out the harm, let's say plaintiff was never actually injured, even though it's fairly clear that the defendant's conduct breached his or her duty, what happens? Well, because this is an elements test or an elements rule, without each and every element, can we establish negligence? The answer is no, we need all of them. Now let's talk about rules with factors. Again, factors are areas of inquiry for the court to consider, but not all factors need to be present for the outcome to occur. So for example, we have outcome X occurs when either A, B, or C is present. Now notice the language here. In our elements rule or elements test, we had the word and. Here for factors, we have the word or. Because again, not all factors need to be present for the outcome to occur. A good indication of, uh, well, because I'm, I'm assuming some of you might be wondering, well, how am I going to keep these straight? Besides looking at and versus or, uh, some good indications of when you're dealing with a factor test, you want to look for things such as balancing tests, totality of the circumstances tests, or sliding scale rules. Okay, these again are, are good, um, good little triggers to know that you're dealing with a factor test. I wanna pause here for a moment because it's critical that you guys remember something. Now, when you're dealing with factors, you have to, have to, have to make sure that you indicate which way the factors cut, okay? Always indicate which way the factors cut. It's one thing to tell your reader what the court considers, but to accurately predict the outcome, which is what your reader is counting on, you can't forget this step. So always, always, always indicate which way the factors cut. For example, all right, so let's say we have this rule to evaluate whether a non-resident defendant's website establishes sufficient forum contacts for general jurisdiction Courts consider the website's level of interactivity and commercial nature. Okay, that's great. We know that the court considers the website's level of interactivity and commercial nature. But do we know what happens if these factors are present? Is the court more or less likely to find sufficient forum contacts for general jurisdiction? We don't know. Additionally, how much or how little of the factors do we need for such outcome? Is a little interactivity okay, or do we need a lot? Is generating some business okay, or do we need a lot? These are questions that your reader will have. And honestly, it's going to damage your credibility as a writer if you leave these questions unaddressed. So what's more helpful for your reader? Courts are more likely to hold that a non-resident defendant's website establishes sufficient forum contacts for general jurisdiction if the website is highly interactive and generates substantial business from forum state residents. All right, notice you're answering those questions that the reader had before with this, um, with this example. So make sure you're indicating which way the factors cut, that's gonna be so important. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is organizing your rules. Now remember, when we're talking about primary or secondary authority, uh, primary, you have your constitutions, statutes, uh, court decisions. Secondary, you're gonna have treatises, law review articles, other published commentaries. Um, one quick thing to mention, what is the restatement? Is that primary? The answer is no. <laughs> the, the restatement is not primary authority. So remember, um, I know some of, of your memos probably are uh, dealing with 
contracts and, and things of that nature, the restatement is not primary. So you're going to want to list your case law first, and then you can use uh, the restatement to kind of bolster uh, your argument. So list primary authority first. You always want to start with mandatory authority uh, versus persuasive. So that's law that is not binding on the court, although the um, the court may in its discretion look to that law for, for guidance. So primary over secondary, mandatory over persuasive, and then recency. I mean, that makes sense, right? You just want to, you want to start with your most recent cases first um, and, you know, then go, go in order. All right. So we've talked about predictive rules. Let's talk about rule synthesis. Okay. So rule synthesis is the process of integrating a rule or principle from several cases. So what does that look like? Well, you're going to extract accurate rules from individual cases, and then you're going to evaluate those extracted rules collectively to create a governing rule or set of rules. So to kind of help piece this together, let's do another example. Our friend Jennifer Walters is back. Now, this time she is writing a synthesized rule about eyewitness accuracy in a criminal case. There's no relevant statute or binding appellate case which clearly articulates the rule in this jurisdiction. But she's in luck because she's found the following rule statements from relevant case law. All right. So the first rule Miss Walters found was if a witness is able to see all of the accused facial features clearly, then the witness's testimony is likely accurate. Her second rule statement she found, for a witness's testimony to be accurate, the witness must see the accused face for longer than a few seconds. And third, although not necessary, a witness who views a crime during bright daylight is assumed to have a more accurate testimony than a witness who views a crime at night. All right, so now that we've extracted our accurate rules, how do we create a governing rule? Well, we have two options. The first is we can just put these all together. We can combine all three rules, but as you'll notice, this takes up quite a bit of space. I mean, we're at 80 words here. And for those of you like me who struggle with um, spacing, you know, creating long rules like this is not going to be helpful. So what's our second option then? Well, here is where rule synthesis is very helpful. We can take the three cases and look for what they stand for when read as a whole. So this means looking at similarities and differences among the cases and evaluate why some cases were resolved similarly to or differently from each other. So let's go ahead, let's take a look at what each of these rules is getting at. Notice our first rule seems to be about what the eyewitness needs to see. Well, the second rule is about how long the witness needs to see it. All right, so we have our what, we have how long, and then the last statement well, this really looks to be describing the when for our rule. So let's put these together and see, you know, how we can state the overarching governing rule in a clear and concise manner. So our synthesized rule will be, if a witness is able to see all of the accused facial features clearly for longer than a few seconds, then the witness's testimony is likely accurate, especially when the incident occurs during bright daylight. All right, now we have a 35 word rule rather than 80 words. And again, for those of you um, who maybe struggle with spacing, rule synthesis is going to be your best friend. All right, so another thing to keep in mind with rule statements is that in order to be accurate, they can't be too broad and they can't be too narrow. So for example, let's say we have the following fact pattern 
And we need to come up with an accurate rule statement that's gonna govern this type of scenario. When more than five witnesses allegedly saw the defendant's car pass through a red light and strike the plaintiff's vehicle, the court precluded testimony as to these facts from more than three witnesses. All right, so what? how can we create an accurate uh, rule statement over this fact pattern? Well, you'll notice, so one, one example is, well, no more than three witnesses may testify for one party at a trial. All right, this is too broad. Notice here, the rule um, does not put a hard limit on the number of witnesses who can testify for a party in general. And I think I, I misspoke, I said rule, but the, the fact pattern, right, above, it doesn't put a hard limit on the number of witnesses who can testify. But the rule here, if we were to write this as a rule, it precludes testimony from more than three witnesses who are testifying on the same facts. Okay, so our second option, let's see. In a vehicle accident case in which the plaintiff alleges that the defendant's car passed through a red light and struck the plaintiff's vehicle, no more than three witnesses may testify as to these facts. Well, while this rule may predict the outcome in another vehicle accident case, uh, where the defendant read a red light, ran a red light, it's not going to tell us much about the admissibility of certain evidence in other cases. And at the end of the day, that's really what we're trying to establish here. Um, and so let's see if we can come up with a better option. Evidence may be inadmissible if it is cumulative and unnecessary. Guys, this really gets to the heart of um, what we were what we were trying to write, right? It's really about when is the evidence going to be um, admissible or inadmissible if it's cumulative and unnecessary. So again, in order to write accurate rules, we have to make sure it's neither too broad uh, nor too narrow. So we've gone through a lot in a little bit of time. So I just wanna do a quick recap for you um, about these helpful tips when creating, creating effective rule statements. So remember the three criteria for rule statements? You want them to be simply stated, readily applied, and consistent with the jurisdictions, cases, and laws. How about what your rule statement should look like? Do you remember? It should look like a funnel, all right? Remember, you wanna list the broadest first and then narrow down into your sub rules, including how and when the rules should be applied. And then anytime you use factors, don't forget to explain what? You've gotta explain which way, whoops, which way they cut. All right. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you feel a little bit better um, going into those memos and uh, writing effective rule statements. If you have any questions, certainly feel free to reach out. The Writing Center is available for you. Um, you know, don't forget to take advantage of that amazing resource. And um, yeah, certainly if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Good luck creating effective rule statements and take care.